serves as the officer in the Human Rights Bureau at the Department of State in the, 19, in the Carter administration in the early 80s, general counsel of the Immigration and Naturalization Service for the Clinton administration, and principal deputy general counsel of the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration. He's been intimately involved in many critical legal and policy developments in the immigration field for many years now, beginning with the Refugee Act of 1980. And most recently, he worked on the federal government's uh, 2010 lawsuit against SB 1070, which is Arizona's restrictive immigration enforcement law. Professor Martin is a graduate of DePaul University and Yale Law School. He served as a clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright and Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. His talk today is entitled, Immigration's Enigma Principle, Protection and Paradox. After his presentation, we are going to have some time for questions and comments, and I'm very grateful that um, Professor Martin has agreed to give us a talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. It's really a great pleasure for me to be back here at uh, another event hosted by the Center for Migration Studies. I can remember going back many, many years, conferences in Washington uh, that led to publications in the volumes called In Defense of the Alien. Um, CMS has come a long way since those days, uh, a number of changes and innovations. Uh, I know you're in very good hands with Don Kerwin here now. I worked with Don on previous projects and, and watched him uh, as he's done some very good things in a host of organizations uh, over the years. Um, so I really uh, appreciate that. I appreciate the, the very kind introduction you provided. Um, now, I'm going to talk today more about prudence than about law. In part, this is because I am discouraged about the current refugee situation globally. Not totally despairing but leaning pessimistic, which is uncharacteristic for me. The world is more dangerous, governance structures are weakening, conflicts are more widespread and vicious, and it seems to me that increasingly ambitious legal claims in this context are sometimes counterproductive. I also draw some discouragement from Europe's response to its current refugee crisis, where a welcome and praiseworthy humanitarian impulse was initially ascendant, but may, uh, but may well have made the problem worse, at least in its early stages. To overcome our current problems, not just regarding protection, but regarding the underlying conflict and persecution that produced the need for protection, we're going to have to rely more on flexible, messy policy tools and not try to carpet the whole arena with legal obligations. My comments, I want to say, are largely descriptive rather than prescriptive. They're built somewhat unsystematically on 37 years of experience in the immigration field as a scholar and as Don mentioned as a government official. So to begin, I hope many of you have seen the movie called The Imitation Game. Have you seen that? Uh, it's uh, the true 1940s story of mathematician Alan Turing and the Allied quest to crack the codes used in the Nazis' Enigma machine. I'm going to use that film, in essence, as the text from which I'll derive a subtle and difficult point about immigration and protection that you may well resist. So be for more. In the film, after months of effort and successive disappointments, the assembled team of brilliant minds finally cracks the Enigma code, decrypts several initial messages, learns that the Nazi forces are Nazi naval forces are massing to attack and sink a large Allied convoy. Having only hours to act, they make excited plans to alert the fleet and save hundreds of lives. Then a sudden turning point. You remember it if you saw the film. A moment of painful but vital insight. Turing tells them they must send no alert, take no protective action. If the convoy diverts now, he explains the Nazis will know that the Enigma code has been broken and they will lose future information on Nazi war plans. The team reluctantly accepts this conclusion, but the pain is magnified because, in the movie version only, one team member's brother is aboard the doomed convoy. Now, it's not that Enigma decryption can never be used to save lives. The movie makes that clear, but its use must observe limits. It will have to be used strategically and selectively 
in order to preserve its long-term potential. Inescapably, some threats will have to go unaddressed. Immediate, known, painful, lethal threats. The Allies followed that course and carrying a significant advantage from the Enigma information, they of course wound up defeating Hitler's Germany. Now, what on earth does the Enigma project have to do with immigration and refugee policy? Uh, it hit me a few weeks after seeing the film that, at least in my view, immigration and particularly refugee protection must be understood to have a similar counterintuitive and messy limiting principle. Secure location across a border in another country, a stable and reasonably well-off country, can do wondrous things to provide protection against persecution and conflict. And for that matter, protection against discrimination, against poor education, against poverty. But it cannot provide such protection or enhancement for all who might seem to have a just claim. This limit has nothing to do, of course, with spilling secrets. It's a product of realism about the strains that migration, especially high volume migration or sudden influxes, can bring to a society. About the capacities of receiving states, and most importantly, about preservation of the political space that we need in order to minimize backlash and keep a healthy level of relocational opportunity alive. It's a matter of finding or restoring a viable equilibrium in order to sustain the needed societal commitment to protection over the long run. Enlightened leaders work to create conditions that will place that new equilibrium at as high a humanitarian threshold as possible, even as they regularly incur criticism, and they do incur criticism, for failing to use protection tools to the maximum of their internal logic. Now an example, perhaps an important one, but a controversial one, can be found in President Clinton's actions on the refugee front during his early presidency. Controversially, he continued for a couple of years the senior President Bush's Haiti interdiction order, which afforded no screening of persecution claims by people who were interdicted and returned, even though Clinton had been harshly critical of that order during the election campaign. Intelligence suggested that a sudden flow of Haitian boats to Florida could materialize within days after the inauguration. Clinton, I believe, judged that such arrivals would crowd out and render impossible a host of other planned initiatives. The Supreme Court's decision sustaining this interdiction, Tara made reference to it, Haitian Center's Council versus Sale, did not mean the end of challenges to that counterintuitive measure to sustain interdiction. Instead, the challenges had to take place in the arena of policy argument, not judicial doctrine. And policy challenges definitely continue, ultimately persuading Clinton to modify interdiction to develop new screening mechanisms. And eventually, they led Clinton to take military action under UN auspices to oust the Haitian coup leaders, restore President Aristide, and thus create better human rights prospects inside that country, which benefited far more people than a boat flow could have accomplished. Clinton's actions, and this, I think, this connection isn't often made. Clinton's actions also helped to sustain the political space needed to introduce calm and sound reforms for what was then an overwhelmed and dysfunctional asylum program during those years. And to do it in a way that avoided overreaction. Ultimately, those reforms, and there were many people here in this room, both in government roles and on the NGO side, uh, who were involved in that long, consultative, constructive process to design those mid-90s <coughs> asylum reforms. Um, ultimately, having those in place as of 1994-1995 helped us head off drastic limits on asylum that came close to enactment as part of the harsh 1996 Immigration Acts. So to sum up, the enigma principle is this. Immigration's enigma principle. Protection must observe limits sometimes painful and counterintuitive limits, in order to maximize protection strategically. But I will say, I, I want to emphasize, a corollary also applies. The enigma analogy must not be seen as an excuse for inaction, that is, for nations to refuse to use protection tools at all. During World War II, enigma was often used to warn or defend potential victims. The whole point of the early choices to withhold action, painful as they were, was precisely to maximize the long-term capacity 
to protect. Also, I would say the Enigma principle is not just a matter of short-sighted or unsympathetic government leaders. It is a structural feature that descriptively con constrains even the most humanitarian government leaders. German Chancellor Merkel is learning this reality. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Now, some people might object to my Enigma analogy because they view the refugee treaties as a broad legal bulwark against such a strategic and calculating stance. In my experience, that is an exaggerated expectation about what law can do, though the treaties and courts applying them certainly have played and will play an important protective role. The treaties do provide an important fulcrum for pushing nations towards setting any equilibrium on a higher plane than ordinary policy debate might produce. That is important. But courts cannot by themselves create and sustain the real world operational space for optimizing protection. They are most effective only if political strains are kept within manageable range. And it usually takes circumstances or actions beyond refugee adjudication, that is beyond the direct scope of the treaties, to achieve that end. Now, what sort of actions? Least controversial, surely least controversial, would be diplomacy or humanitarian intervention to end the war or persecution in the home state. We do talk a lot about the need to address root causes, and it's important. But let's not kid ourselves. Truly eliminating root causes is extraordinarily <coughs> difficult and costly. And the recent failures of several initiatives, military and, and humanitarian initiatives, uh, makes it even harder to persuade people to undertake uh, those steps. Therefore, the limitation imperative also finds expression beyond root causes in decisions to impose restrictive conditions on, uh, on, or detention on waiting asylum seekers. And sometimes, as, as Tara talked about, on barriers to access, such as maritime interdiction. Now, I do want to emphasize that the drafters of the primary refugees treat refugee treaties held a pragmatic outlook that's consistent with the Enigma principle. They, those drafters, were quite sensitive to the need to observe limits on the protection pledges that they were crafting. To start with, they did not provide for legally mandated shelter against all harms, especially not against the risk of violence as a result of armed conflict. More explicitly, the 1951 convention limited its coverage to persons displaced as a result of events occurring before 1951. A dateline that in principle marked out a largely known and finite population already present. More importantly and less obviously, the 1951 convention, although it has important guarantees against returning refugees already present, is pointedly silent about legal obligations governing access to national t territory. You heard former Deputy High Commissioner Lenikoff speak about that as well. The convention and the protocol don't talk about access. And some very leading humanitarian figures, scholars who were involved in that original drafting effort, like Paul Weiss, um, wrote articles saying, no, it does not include any kind of a principle about non-rejection at the frontier. The drafters sent clear signals that they wanted to keep their protection commitments in balance with the traditional sovereign right to make deliberate decisions about inbound migration. Numerous statements by government representatives and even international organization leaders at the conference emphasized that they were not writing, and I quote, a blank check. The drafters set forth rules about treatment of people already present and deliberately did not provide a right of access. They acknowledged, they did very much acknowledge, though, that this was an uncomfortable position. They acknowledged that it would be best to do more than the treaty would require in a lot of respects, including access for an acceptance of new asylum seekers whenever possible. But they left this more in recommendations appended to the treaty and meant to inform all the policy decisions not to set inflexible legal mandates. Now, I acknowledge that critics of the legal bulwark persuasion may feel that they have an unanswerable reputation these days. Whatever the initial intentions treaty framers many decades ago, some courts, particularly in Europe, have deployed what's sometimes called dynamic treaty interpretation to issue rulings greatly restricting government authority to use interdiction or other deterrent measures. For example, the 2012 ruling of the European Court of Human Rights 
to which Chair made reference, Hersey Jama versus Italy, imposes severe limitations on any maritime interdiction. And I do think those courts did want to impose a more absolute understanding of the logic of protection and consequently squeeze out a lot of government discretion along the lines that I have mentioned somewhat favorably. But as Justice Holmes reminded us, the life of the law has not been logic. It has been experience. The current European refugee crisis is providing and will continue to provide an experience, a good experiential testing ground of whether legal rulings like that impede or facilitate the achievement of a healthy, protective, and workable new equilibrium. So in that vein, let me offer just a few further reflections on the current refugee drama playing out in Europe. And here I'm going to switch texts. I want to build on some insightful comments offered by David Miliband earlier this month. As most of you know, David Miliband is now the head of the International Rescue Committee. He's based here in New York. And he served for three years as the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom in his last Labor government. Remarking on the tragic chaos of the European response to Syrian refugees, he stated, and I quote, people want compassion and competence. If you have compassion without competence, then there is danger of a backlash. Deploy your protection tools carefully and thoughtfully, in other words, or you may do more harm than good. It's not quite the enigma principle, but it reflects similar thinking. So let's reflect for a moment on Germany's role over the last several months in responding to the plight of Syrian refugees. As a starting point, one has to give Germany, and particularly Chancellor Merkel, high marks for compassion. It was a genuine surprise to me, at least, when she staked out her resolutely compassionate humanitarian stance in August. She indicated that Germany would accept very large numbers of Syrian <coughs> refugees and would not impose the usual Dublin Convention rules that treat asylum seekers as the responsibility of the European state where they entered Europe rather than the state where they really want to arrive. Whatever, Europea, whatever Europe eventually does to overcome its current disorganized crisis, the result will hold much more for the welfare of Syrian refugees than if Merkel had not taken that position. She has moved the world community's response to a higher level of humanitarian action, and she deserves a lot of credit for that. Nonetheless, the manner of announcement of that policy and the subsequent steps taken to implement it unnecessarily aggravated the risk to refugees in my view, and the harm particularly the harm to interstate relations within Europe, in ways that might have been avoided had more careful and competent thought been given, been given up front to actual implementation. First, some of the problem may derive from unexamined assumptions that refugees are going to stream in great numbers anyway. People hear about barrel bombs and ISIS atrocities in Syria and think, of course, the desperation is so great that everyone would flee, barriers cannot stop them. Commentators and even many government officials repeat this mantra. But we need to look far more closely at this well-intentioned misunderstanding about refugees. Refugees are not particles in a flowing stream. As was emphasized by somebody over here in the first session this morning, they are people uprooted from normal, competent lives by extraordinary events. And they remain strong, competent actors in choosing actions that will protect their families. They look at risks at home, but they also keep shrewdly alert to the possibilities available in other countries. This is especially so in the era of Twitter and Facebook and instant communications. I, I got a, I, I'm on the email list for IRC. I've worked with them for many years. I got a, a, an item the other day that said, what are the 10, just to inform their donors, well, what are the 10 most asked questions, most often asked questions that we get from Syrian asylum seekers? Number one, when they land in Greece. Number one is, where am I? They want to be sure they're in Greece and not in Turkey or someplace else. Number two is, do you have Wi-Fi? <laughs> Seriously, number two is, do you have Wi-Fi? So they're well connected. There's instant communication. Uh, and this, moreover, and, and this is overlooked, by the inexorable flow commentators. The current stream toward Europe is composed overwhelmingly of people who already had some form of refuge in camps and settlements in the region. In that light, what accounts for the major increase in departures this summer? But one highly important element, which has not gotten much attention in the popular press, although it was certainly referred to in the previous panel, was deteriorating, or the groundwork was, 
uh, was deteriorating conditions in the refugee camps in the region. In early 2015, the world community seemed to have lost interest in the welfare of the people housed there. UNHCR appeals for absolutely necessary funding, as was described, were falling woefully short. In June, the world was meeting only 35% of the UNHCR budget needed for Syrian refugees in the region. In response, the UN was forced to make drastic cuts in food rations and basic health care facilities. An anguished high commissioner was quoted in The Guardian, calling the situation, quote, beyond irreparable. And he also suggested that malnutrition, illness, and otherwise deteriorating conditions in the camps were prompting what was then a much more modest uptick in those dangerous Mediterranean crossings. This was a gross failure of both compassion and confidence. And then came Chancellor Merkel's August announcement that Syrian asylum applications would be accepted in Germany without the Dublin limitations. Germany, Germany, the economic powerhouse of Europe, offering what? A status that would provide for full security, employment, education for the children. No wonder tens of thousands marooned in the resource-starved camps began moving northwest in the summer. Refugee flows are not products of nature. They are dynamic, influenced by many calculations. Now, I'm also convinced that Syrian refugees have a very well-honed appreciation of the immigration enigma principle, that protection must and will observe limits. Though, of course, they wouldn't articulate it in that way. Germany's openness, they perceive, cannot last, at least not in the expansive form suggested by the Chancellor's August remarks. Signs of reaction and political backlash are already virulently present in Germany and in many parts of Europe, and indeed, sadly, in the United States. Having glimpsed that open door, Syrians and actually many people of many other nationalities want to get to Germany before the opening is narrowed or closed. So the current bad weather is not, at least not yet, bringing any diminution in the numbers. Another unfortunate feature of the German offer as it was originally manifested, is its implicit rule about who will qualify. As one Greek professor commented to an American group of scholars visiting the island of Lesbos, quote, why do people have to walk 3,000 kilometers? If that self-help requirement crudely was Germany's default method for limiting the intake, we can say many things about how it scores under the confidence criteria. First, it's not working very well to keep the numbers down. That was its intent. Second, it's both capricious as a selection principle and potentially quite cruel, even lethal. Third, and of deep importance on a regional level, it's hard to imagine a process more likely to exacerbate relations with the other European states along the route and thereby push politics toward an exaggerated backlash. We're going to take a lot of people, they want to come to our country, you've got to deal with them for several weeks while they make their way in vast numbers along the way. One must not absolve those other states, particularly Hungary, of blame for harsh and inhumane responses. But one can understand a serious level of frustration with Germany's policy, announced without consultation apparently, which quite predictably led to those astounding scenes of tired masses trudging along one lane of a superhighway or being herded in massive columns through pastures and cornfields. Germany's approach reflects a sharp difference in the instinctive ways in which Americans and Europeans initially think about responding to refugees. Europeans, for historical reasons that are understandable, tend to focus on a reactive asylum model, adjudicating claims by people who arrive on their own power. American refugee policies have many shortcomings, but once activated to address a refugee crisis, we do tend to think rather quickly of a wider array of proactive policy tools for response. Historically, of course, this means a major focus on organized resettlement programs, flying people from the region of origin after a selection process. Right now, a far too cumbersome uh, and lengthy selection process, but uh, I know that USCIS and DHS are very much in the process of taking significant steps to try to find ways to reorganize and revise those processing mechanisms. In any event, we typically don't make people walk across the country. 
We're now seeing the beginnings of policy changes in Europe that build on some of these lessons from the last few months, and at least partial fulfillment of the Enigma principle, or in Miliband's terms, as a way of infusing more confidence into the compassion. First, and really important, the neglect of funding for the camps in the Middle East region is being remedied, at least in significant part. The EU and other donor, donors are stepping up to meet UNHCR funding needs more closely. Perhaps this will reduce the pressures to leave the region. There's also apparent movement by European powers in the United States to take more vigorous military action to address the root threats inside Syria. That too is welcome, but we certainly cannot expect any early success and may see additional setbacks as part of that process. <coughs> Moreover, a Brussels summit meeting last weekend reported steps to set up new reception centers in various places along the main routes in Europe, especially in Greece and the key Balkan states. This policy change may someday bring Europe to something more like an orderly departure program, or ODP, the Vietnam era analogy, which some of you will recall vividly. The departures would start not within Syria, but from camps in Turkey, Lebanon, or Jordan, or elsewhere along the transit route where refuge seekers would be interviewed, adjudicated, and if accepted, assigned to a receiving country in the EU, at least according to preliminary reports. Indeed, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's, yeah. Indeed, the whole situation might have unfolded with less confusion and trauma if Germany had channeled its compassionate impulses from the beginning into an ODP-like program. A viable ODP, however, and I think that, that may be the direction in which we're headed, a viable ODP, however, would have to be bolstered with some systematic action to slow or block other migration routes outside the ODP channels. The Brussels report obliquely acknowledges this much. I suspect that planning did not turn in that direction at first because it's not clear how much room is left for such steps after European court rulings like Hirsi Jama. Tragically, expansive judicial requirements meant the situation had to become much worse in terms of deaths and drownings worsened relations among European receiving states, and the strengthening of virulent and anti-immigrant parties before European leaders would start thinking seriously and painfully along these lines. Now, I want to be completely clear. I do not favor, I do not favor access barriers or harsh reception conditions. But in my experience, government leaders, even or especially well-intentioned government leaders, sometimes find them necessary as they struggle to head off worse backlash or worse legislation. Therefore, opposition to barriers is most productive, not when it talks in the inflexible language of legal absolutes, but when it is policy-based, context-specific, cognizant of the wider environment, and focused on really workable alternatives that still address the government's genuine worries. Often such advocacy, and I've taken part in it, in the government, as have some other people who are here today, at least open some protection features within a broader set of measures meant to deter a block. Now, to finish, we will see whether the troubling political reactions building in Europe over the last few months causes some tempering of judicial logic and brings greater realism about the need to observe carefully implemented limits while still holding true, holding true to the core protections of refugee law. As Reinhold Niebuhr reminded us in his major work titled The Irony of American History, quote, there is no purely moral solution for the ultimate moral issues of life, but neither is there a viable solution which disregards start with and then we could, we could go to the to the audience we have a, a couple of minutes right five ten minutes not not much okay so I had the occasion recently to reread one of David's um, articles from 
25 years ago that was published in the International Migration Review, and it asked, it asked the question, why did human rights, legal instruments, hard, hard legal instruments, soft legal instruments, declarations of all kinds, why did they expand after World War II? And the conclusion was, it was one of the a very interesting article, a very valuable article. In fact, we built our one of our pieces around it in our, in our special collection. And the, and the conclusion was is because states uh, had no interest or intention of abiding by any of them. No. I mean, it, it basically, and I think that there, I think that there's some truth to that. And NGOs at some point started to take that language and hold it against politically their their states, and that's how kind of human rights protections and systems started to be developed around the world. I, I take it that the Enigma um, Principles lesson is similar to that in a way, which is that you have to, you have to, win, you can't expect um, um, expansions of the law indefinitely. And in fact, there's there's really no, nothing worse than people or, or states that agree to um, conventions and make pronouncements and have absolutely zero intention of abiding by them. And you kind of have to win the political, diplomatic policy arguments to, and kind of do that very hard work to create safe space for people. That's, so I, I feel like the Enigma principle is kind of building on that earlier article, actually. Um, I guess I feel like uh, I'm a little bit more sympathetic with Angela Merkel, though, I must say. that um, I, don't, I don't see that she's violated the Enigma principle in the sense that she, I don't think she was pushing for big changes in the law. I think that she was probably extraordinarily frustrated with the lack of any progress among EU member states and was doing what leaders try to do, which is to, um, which is to make statements that would change public opinion, create kind of a new, you know, a new, a new reality, a new political kind of reality on the ground, which I think she did. But, in, but anyway, that's, that's my response. I find it very, a very interesting um, talk, and I really appreciate it. And I do, I do think that that's true about the, doing the hard work of, um, not the easy work of castigating states for um, not adopting ever more absolute legal regimes, but actually the hard work of convincing the public and states of the need to protect and the value of protecting people. I, uh, a couple of reactions there. I, 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 do, uh, I do agree with that. I think there are some, some ways in which there are parallel, parallel dynamics in those two articles, 25 years apart. Um, the, uh, the main way is, is, is thinking about the ways in which people can pressure governments uh, that might be inclined to go in a different direction and how they can, can, can have an impact on them. In that time of writing, in 1989, uh, human rights efforts were just getting underway. Human rights NGOs were uh, uh, there was a, a, a much uh, a much less rich field than what we see today. And um, as I looked at trying to prepare that for the 25th anniversary issue of IMR, um, I, I was asked, well, well, what can we do to, to to bring practice more in line with the doctrine? And it occurred to me, well, there's two ways of doing that. You can change the doctrine and mirror practice, or you can try to push it the other way. Obviously, um, the people who asked me, and who asked that question, wanted it to be that it would change and come closer to, to the law. Well, why, if the practice was that far apart, and much farther apart in those days than today, why did we have these kinds of uh, strong provisions <coughs> in the law? And a lot of it, I concluded, was because many states, not all states, but many states really thought they were going through empty exercises agreeing to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, even taking part in and initially signing some of the human rights treaties. They just didn't think there would be, and, and, but most importantly with declarations and soft law instruments, didn't think it would ever have any real consequence. And we found in the 1980s that organizing uh, and policy advocacy began to make very effective use of those documents there. It's not, Mr. Dictator, that we're trying to impose some kind of Western ideas on you. You signed a treaty that said that these these are the standards. So that was that was the kind of that was the kind of fulcrum that was best there. We've come a really long way in the last 25 years. Legal regimes have proliferated. The uh, the case law, the decisions, um, quite extensive. Um, but I but to me now it's at a point where that kind of advocacy is no longer quite so apt or so needed, or it's certainly not novel. You're not surprising governments now that they're going to be held 
held accountable to them. So what's needed is more of the kind of thing that, that recognizes some of these are hard problems that involve, involve trade-offs, and we want to couch our advocacy in those terms instead of just announcing them as someone who's not living up to what we're interpreting as a, an absolute legal obligation, even though maybe the framers of the treaty did not. Yes, Alex? David, when you first mentioned um, the Miliband argument, you very quickly said it's not really, it's not quite the Enigma principle, but it's close enough. I think they're, they're quite different. I mean, I think, I take the Enigma principle to be simply a utilitarian calculation. We're going to suffer a few harms now for greater benefits later, and on balance, it's better to do that, but if some people die, they die. The, I take the Miliband argument to be one about Pareto superiority, that we want to move to a situation, a, a set of rules that improves people's conditions without hurting, without, without imposing costs. That's what compassion plus, plus confidence would, would produce. So I, I view these as very different principles. You can test them out in the, the case you raised about the Haitian interdiction. Because the, the, the interdiction and return policy was a utilitarian calculation. In part, and it was often justified that people were going to die at sea unless we they pick a murder. So on balance, this will, we will save more lives or something, you know, or the flow will be so great into Florida that it had these terrible consequences, et cetera. But I think the safe haven policy was the pretty superior move where you could actually improve the situation through a competent kind of policy that then evolved into something else um, without imposing the costs. Now maybe you can say that there was a cost of not being able to come to the United States as a whole, but, but it, it expanded things. So I think there's a big difference between these two. And I think on the Enigma principle, I don't know why then one wouldn't say, you know, if 2,000 people died sitting in the Mediterranean, at least it stopped the flow and, you know, prevented many more people dying, so that's okay. I don't think we can ever get to that position. I don't think we'd ever want to print. We'd ever, and I, in the end, when you go to Merkel, you actually apply the Miliband principle, not the, not the Enigma principle. Well, I, I think there's still a little bit of the uh, of the, the limitation principle that's going to have to come into play in the ultimate unfolding of uh, a new and more stable and uh, more sustained European uh, response along these lines. And I think, uh, I mean, there are different points. I, many of you may know Alex and I have been doing a case work on immigration law together. Uh, for some 30 some years, and this is the kind of conversation and argument we would have. Should it be Bentham or should it be Pareto? I mean, and my students don't actually always group to that. Uh, but uh, but anyway, but I mean, so I, I think they're the same. And 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 it's true. There are. It, it is more a matter of. I think sometimes applying confidence though involves and necessarily requires taking account of certain kinds of limits, certain places that one has to, certain concessions one has to make to the political realities of trying to sustain this. It's not just a matter of ill-intentioned leaders. It's a matter of, we pay chances to see it sometimes, really agonizing decisions um, that are being made by, by leaders with humanitarian impulses, uh, but also political realism. I don't think we can forget where Angela Merkel came from, East Germany. It may be something that is deep in her psyche and heart, recognizing the situation of the East Germans. Could be, who knows. I just want to also add to the uh, information you had about the relevant, uh, wonderful end of the 80s, where we passed TPS, Temporary Protected Status. It wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell today. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they're trying to get rid of it, but it is a great solution that the voluntary agents at that time pushed through Congress. There was an openness to it. It's kind of the solution of the situation today, but to say you're going to permanently uh, resettle people without any of the, 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 the spade work that should go forward is, is probably foolhardy. But to tell them you have temporary protected status here, if the situation ever gets better, which it might by some miracle, but it could happen, it's a better way to deal with these kind of uh, massive flows and to have people traipsing uh, 3,000 kilometers is just incredible. But just uh, another insight, perhaps. 
Thank you very much. And I, I do want to emphasize, I meant to say that in response uh, to Don's comment. Uh, I really do mean to be primarily here praising Angela Merkel. And sometimes you need to make statements and just see how what it does to shake up a frozen public opinion situation. And maybe that's what she had in mind. But I do think there are ways in which that could have been combined with some other thinking that would not have involved um, quite the kinds of consequences in terms of bad relations with other countries and the apparent selection principle. Right? Some way of moving people from the region. Um, but she's, she's, she's gotten the attention and she's certainly stimulated um, greater resources and greater thinking about a whole host of ways, different ways to address that situation. We should we should probably end, but maybe maybe one more question. How's how's that? And then, um, yeah. um, I just wanted to make a couple of com uh, comments that have been uh, concerning me all all day as I've been listening. Uh, we've talked a lot about Europe and what's happening in Europe, and we have said that this has been going on in Syria for many, or in the Middle East in general for many years. It hasn't just happened. But now we're just starting to talk about it here in the US. And my real concern is, why are we just starting to talk about it now? Is it because this is the Middle East? Is it because this is a political issue that here in the United States we consider anything in the Middle East or anything <coughs> as terrorism? Is it our fear? Um, why are we talking so much about what, what is happening in Europe, which is amazing, and I think that Merkel is to be blessed because what she has done and the humanitarian issue, the, the humanitarian actions she has taken are amazing. I mean, these people, these are families, these are children, these are people who are running away, not are, are leaving their countries, not because they want to, but because they have to. They have no other choice. And I think that we're taking this in such an academic sort of, you know, way of looking at things. Um, I just feel that we have to address this in a more realistic way. And here in the United States, we need to start talking about it more. We've seen it on television and only because it's happening in Europe. But what have we done here? I mean, we talk about we're bringing in 80,000 or 800,000, I don't know, whatever the number is. Where are they? When are they coming? Are we going to wait years? I mean, they've been in these camps. We've said that they're in these camps. We've said that the camps are unbearable, that the situation there is intolerable. But we've accepted it. We haven't even really talked about it. So we talk in very academic terms, and that's great. And we've done it all, all day. But my, my question is, when are we really going to take this not as the Middle East, terrorism, Arabs? What are we going to do with these Syrians when they get here? We don't want them in our communities because they're all a bunch of terrorists. They're going to kill us, they're going to harm us, whatever it is. When are we going to really look at it as a humanitarian issue? and take some steps. Well, let, let me say, uh, make a couple comments about that. I, I, I really think it, it's not an academic perspective to try to have some understanding of the way that it looks from the perspective of government leaders who are trying to shape an overall policy, keep it alive, keep <coughs> it going, respond to the, the various other kinds of uh, objections that it throws off, and to try to minimize those, minimize reactionary responses, minimize xenophobic responses. And you know, sometimes things that people try along those lines don't work very well. Other times they, they may help a bit. We never have the counterfactual developed, so we don't know how, how far it works. So I don't I don't I don't think that's that's a, an academic point of view. Um, we have uh, we have treated it as uh, a humanitarian issue. Um, there are Resettlement goes on there, but I, I mean, I, I don't think the government, I don't think we necessarily need to take it as a situation where the United States always has to be right out in the lead in dealing with issues of this sort. So to think of that, that particular uh, set of issues, at least initially, as something where the United States would take part but wouldn't necessarily be a leader, doesn't necessarily reflect that we're not treating it as humanitarian. We, we're taking more refugees have been commented on more refugees than from worldwide than, than other countries uh, put together in our resettlement program, and that's important and it should continue, and it manifests a genuine humanitarian uh, impulse. So I, I think I think that's the case, and I, and I think another complication, which, which now I think we are past, but at least in the early times of the conflict, there were hopes that maybe there would be a resolution 
there. Remember the hope, how hopeful we were in many settings at the time of the Arab Spring. It seems like an awfully long time ago. There was hope that, well, maybe somehow, yes, there, there was worse and more violent resistance in Syria than just about any place else except maybe Libya. Um, but maybe that would play itself out. People should get protection in the region. We hope we can have that resolved. Once ISIS showed up on the scene, and well, certainly now with the Russian support uh, for Assad, uh, I, I mean, we, we, were, we were coming to realize that we were, that was not going to be a short-term kind of issue. So I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be quite as, as negative about that. There, there are, except the refugee program, a lot of people here are involved in it. We get involved in the daily work of whatever we're doing in our agencies, our government agencies, our NGOs, our VALAGs. Um, we, we maybe get immersed in that, but that's a humanitarian enterprise, and even that daily routine does reflect those kinds of values. So let's remember that. We, we can certainly do better. I take that point uh, very much. But um, uh, we need to, we need to, to keep uh, this kind of perspective. Thank you, David. We appreciate it.